Good morning. Welcome to MI Church. Hey, if this is your first time here, first things first, we are so glad you're with us. Hey, would you stand? And one more thing, and some of you have heard this a lot, but I really recommend you do it. Out in the lobby, there's a place called Connection Point. You can get a sweet gift and you can find out what it means to be this church, what it means to be a part of this amazing thing. So it's a wonderful opportunity we have. So thanks for coming.
Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather. We thank you for this opportunity to be a part of something so much greater than ourselves. And God, we thank you especially this morning for Jesus Christ, for what he did. God, we thank you that he paid this amazing sacrifice for us, that he died for us, but God, then he rose and then he called us to new life. So we thank you for salvation. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to rejoice in who you are and what you've done for us. And so God, we simply want to say thank you. I pray in Jesus' name.
you have your Bibles and you want to follow along this morning, we're going to be looking at the exact same set of verses we looked at last week, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be starting in verse 6. If you're joining us online, thank you. I'm glad you are. If you want to get your Bibles out, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Last week, we looked at this passage to take in the traps, the warnings, a little bit more negative perspective, but sometimes you've got to get the warnings first before you can really reap the benefits, the glean the blessings, however you, you want to say that. The traps that we looked at last week, we're going to see them again when we look through these verses. The two major traps that he focuses on are arrogance and addiction. These words where it talks about the love of money and the desire, it's really talking or using the language of addiction. It's something that grows in your life. You just have, you feed off of it. You have to have more and more. We talked about that last week. Today, I want to focus on the positive side here because there are some treasures. And what I mean by that is this is something God, uh, uh, I believe God really wants to bless us financially, regardless of how great or little that might be. Wow, I have to be so careful in, in, in my terminology here because this gets so misrepresented. In fact, the very first verse here in verse 6 where we're picking up, he starts off with the word but, doesn't he? And he starts off with the word but because he's, he's, he's presenting a contrast here because too many times finances and the relationship to the message has been perverted and, and, and at the end of the day, I think as God's people, we have to be really patient with people who get apprehensive when you talk about the subject of money. You know why? Because too many times people have misrepresented it. They have used the gospel message to make certain people wealthy, and that's not the purpose. The blessing or the treasure, I do want us to see, however, are two key words. And, and here they are. I, I want to present them before we actually read through these verses so that you'll be you'll be able to really focus on these. Word number one would be contentment. Contentment. And word number two would be generosity. Both contentment and generosity are very much tied to a wonderful blessing that God wants to bring into our life. In fact, they're not just tied to that. They're tied to each other. We actually can have contentment through being generous if our relationship with God's right and we get this. If we get this. Contentment, let me go ahead and define that right up front. Contentment, in Scripture, the concept is this. And specifically, in dealing with money, it doesn't make any difference how much I do have or don't have. That's irrelevant. Remember how the Apostle Paul put this over when he was writing the church at Philippi? I've learned to be content with much or with little, with excess or with nothing, right? Contentment is that inner satisfaction that inner peace, that joy, happiness of the soul, regardless of how much you have. Well, it sounds like a pipe dream, doesn't it? But that's exactly what God is focusing on in passages like this. You can have that kind of contentment. In, in fact, in fact it's, it's even stretching our minds a little bit more because you can have that kind of contentment through generosity. When, when, when most of the time, most people think, isn't, isn't that 180 out? Isn't, isn't that the opposite of what it's going to take to make me happy? Don't I have to have a little bit more coming my way? And God says, no, if you can just get this, and I, and I know it sounds, it sounds like upside down, doesn't it? Right? But if you can just get this properly understood, the more generous you are, the more contentment you can find in God. Okay, I've spent enough time setting this up. Let's go ahead and read these verses. He says here in verse 6, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Okay, right, right up front, he's talking about this contentment. We talked about this verse last week. He's not saying you have to give it all away, and just bare necessities, that's the way you're supposed to live. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is this, you can, in fact, I don't want to say it that way. It's not just you can, God wants you to find contentment regardless how much or how little you have. It's the desires of God's, uh, God's heart. In fact, I think this becomes more clear as we read a little bit more. First of all, some more warnings. Verse 9, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. This sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? We really do have to, have to keep our defenses up. Verse 10, for the love of money is root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. Skip on down there to verse 17. Command those who are rich. 
reason we're skipping these verses, he comes back and focuses more on on money in, in particular. In verse 17, he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or put their hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We're going to finish this in just a second, but I want you to hang on to that last phrase. He says, don't put your hope in something that's so uncertain. He says, put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You do know we're talking about money here, right? Listen, there's a story in the Old Testament that just really gets, well, there's a lot of stories that really get me. But this story in 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 12, is a passage where a prophet by the name of Nathan comes and confront, confronts King David. King David, remind yourself, man after God's own heart. He's, he, he's a righteous man, a good man. God blessed him in a lot of different ways, did a lot of wonderful things. And you could just see how much he loves the Lord. In fact, he wrote most of the Psalms. You read the Psalms, it's like, wow, this guy's really close with God. Yeah, he's close to God. Yeah, he's a good man. Man, really blew it, really stumbled, did some terrible things. And so, one of the things that happens here in 2 Samuel chapter 12 is the prophet of God comes and confronts him. You know what? You've got to confess sin. You've got to repent sin. You've got to repent of your sin. You've got to get beyond it. And the prophet's here to help in that process, right? But, but, but here's, here's why I want to bring this to your mind. When the prophet Nathan comes to David and confronts him, one of the things he does is he rehearses all the blessings that God's brought into your life. He, he talks about, David, what were you before? You were just a shepherd, right? Look what God has done to you. Look at all the things he's given you. And here's what it says. This is verse 8 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. The prophet says, God has not only done all this, if that weren't enough, he would have given you more. Would you, would you please just let that soak in for just a minute? Here's a guy so richly blessed in so many different ways, and God was saying, you know what? When you, when you were hanging with me, when you were following me, when you were doing what, what I wanted you to do, I was so pleased. What happened? You know, if it's because you weren't blessed enough, I was ready to give you more. The reason I want you to think about that is sometimes, especially when it comes to finances, I, I, I think we, we all get a little bit apprehensive. We look at Scripture, it's like, oh, no, don't think I want to talk about this. Why? Because I think it's going to be tough. Listen, it may be tough, but it's a tough thing that God wants to use to make us better. Okay, let me get back to the verse. I, I, I just want to look at this from the proper perspective. God's not looking over us to, to mess us up. God's looking over us to bless us. And He says, don't put your hope in money, but put your hope in God who richly provides for everything for our enjoyment, command them to do good and be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves. Through this generosity, you're laying up treasure for yourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. If you've been studying with uh, the men's group on Monday night, uh, there's two words in the New Testament we've been talking about uh, that are translated life. One uh, bios, we get the word biology from this, the study of life just existing. It's not the word used here. This is the word zoe, and zoe means living life the way it's meant to be life. We're going to come back to that thought, but here's the question I want to, I, I just want us to spend the remainder of our time focusing on one thing. If this is really a treasure, and if I'm understanding this passage, it is, and it's talking about a way that God really wants to enrich and bless our lives. The treasure is this, being content, having an inner satisfaction and joy by being very generous in the things of God. If you already understand that and you already get that and you're already there, you can tune me out, the sermon's over. But my guess is most of us have a big question mark in our mind and we say to ourselves, I wish I were more content. I've tasted of that fruit before. I just wish I had more contentment and be able to be more generous at the exact same time. In fact, I wish my generosity, giving it away, actually made me feel more full. Well, if you're with me and you want to explore how that happens, you can pay attention to the rest of the sermon, <laughs> okay? And I'm just going to try to answer that one question as biblically as I can, but I'm going to take the long path, okay? So hang, hang on. 
Here we go. There's a, there's a book I've been reading recently. It's by a guy named David Epstein. It just fascinates me. In this book, he presents a lot of statistics that I, I know are going to bore a lot of people, but, but, I, but I warned you, right? It's a long kind of answer. Hang in there for just a second. It's going someplace. He was talking about some studies done in the 1980s. In the 1980s, they were trying to uh, uh, assess people's mental ability, probably problem-solving ability, right? And they did this by starting with a, uh, with a hypothetical situation presented back in the 1930s. I'm saying this because, because uh, if you don't put it in the proper historical context, uh, your mind's going to go someplace else. Here, here's what happened. In the 1930s, there was a researcher who presented this hypothetical, this made-up situation to people just to see how they would think. And he said, pretend like you're a doctor. Put, your in, put yourself in the shoes of a medical doctor, and you've got a patient that comes to you, and this patient that comes to you has a, has a tumor deep within their uh, abdominal cavity, deep, deep within, right? It's inoperable. You cannot go in and take the tumor out. In fact, the only thing at your disposal, the only way that you're going to be able to treat this tumor is through radiation treatment. But here's the problem, and here's, here's what he wants people to, 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 to wrestle with. To get the proper dosage, the, the, the intensity of the radiation that will actually kill the tumor, you're going to kill the patient. Because this radiation beam, it kills everything in its path. So even if you, even if you focus right there on the, on the tumor itself, you're going to kill everything else, and it's deep within the person, so you're going to kill them. Now, if you lower, lower the intensity of the radiation so it won't kill the person, you're not going to kill the tumor. So how are you going to save the patient? Well, people were thinking about that, and they said, well, while you're thinking about that, let me tell you another story. It's a story about a general. This general was fighting against this dictator, this terrible dictator, who was, who was hiding out in his fortress in the middle of his country. And the general knew, because I guess he had fought against this guy before, but he knew that if he had all his troops with him, all he would have to do, if he had all of his troops, he could easily overtake that fortress. He could easily take down this evil dictator, and the world would be a better place if he did that. The problem is, he's in this fortress, and it's in the middle of his country, and all the roads that lead to this fortress are, are just peppered with these landmines. And so there's no way he can march all of his troops in there because he'd lose too many of his troops. By the time he got to the fortress, there wouldn't be enough of an army there to overtake the fortress, right? So, so if he reduced the number of his troops so that he wouldn't lose anybody to the landmines, he wouldn't have enough troops by the time he got there. So here's what the general decided to do. He had everybody in his army synchronize their watches, and he divided them up into small enough groups that they would, their lives wouldn't be lost. They could negotiate the paths right and, and avoid the landmines. But he separated them to many different roads throughout the country in small enough numbers that they could each negotiate their path and not hit the landmines, but they would all arrive at the fortress at the exact same time, and he'd have his army there, and they could overtake the evil dictator. Have you saved the patient's life yet, by the way? I got one more story for you. This is another story that the researchers told. It was about a, it was about a fire chief, fire chief who was trying to help people in this uh, farming community put out a fire. The, the woodshed had caught fire, and th there's a lot of fuel, right? Woodshed fire, and it's close to the house, and the fire is growing, and it looks like it's going to touch the house any minute, and if it continues to grow, everybody's pretty sure the house is going to be gone. Dozens of neighbors have come out, and they formed a bucket brigade. Why? Because there's not a hydrant close enough. So they've got dozens of buckets, you know, pails, two to five gallons each, right? There's dozens of people out there, and there's somebody down on a lake close enough to the house, and he's filling up the bucket and handing it to the next person. They hand him a dry bucket. That person's grabbing that bucket, you know, bucket brigade, handing it to the next person. Dozens of people, and they, they have this assembly line, and the person by the, by the woodshed is just frantically, you know, uh, two gallons, five gallons, two gallons. But guess what? He's losing the battle. Fire's growing. When the fire chief gets there, he sees what's going on, and all these dozens of people wanting to help out save the house, he orders them, stop. Everybody's kind of, oh, why? why should we stop? We're already losing the battle. We need to try even harder. But they trust the fire chief, so they all stop. And he orders them to all, the dozens of them, take all their buckets, go down to the lake at the same time. He has them all fill their buckets with the water at the same time. Then he gets them back up to the woodshed, and they make this big circle around the woodshed. And he says, on the count of three, I want you to dump. One, two, three. And at the count of three, boom, hundreds of gallons, boom, and the fire's all out. By the way, have you saved the patient yet? You had the tumor? When they did this study in the 1980s and they, they gave this scenario to people about this patient who has a tumor deep within him, and if you have enough radiation, you're going to kill the guy, only 10% of the people were able to save the patient. But when they told them the story about the general who overtook the fortress, now 30% of the people who heard that story were able to save the patient. Then when they told them the story about the fire chief, 
Now, 50% of the people involved in this mental exercise were able to save the patient. And then they did one more thing after telling them all these stories. They said, by the way, those stories, if you properly understand them, are going to help you save the patient. Now, 80% of people are able to save the patient. And I'm so tempted not to give you the answer to this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Because the way these stories, you already get it. I'm sure 80% of my audience is already there. But the stories relate like this. You've got too much radiation, you're going to kill the person. So you divide up the doses so they're much smaller so it won't kill the person. And you go from several different angles around the body so they all converge at the same time with enough, enough intensity on the tumor to actually kill the t- tumor without killing the patient. Why in the world is Mark taking so much time to talk about this? Because... Because there's a subject that Jesus chose to talk about more than sex, more than truth and lying, more than hypocrisy, more than spiritual matters of the heart, and it's the subject of money. He talked about it so often and gave so many instructions, and after he talked about it and gave instructions, he told stories. We usually refer to them as parables, and he didn't just tell one parable. He'd tell parable after parable, and sometimes he'd tell a parable after a parable after a parable, and at the conclusion of those parables, you know what he'd often say? He'd often say, by the way, this is about you and your money. <laughs> Do you think God really wants us to understand something here? Yes, I really I'm all over this. I'm thinking God really wants us to understand something. Why? Because he wants us to experience the treasure. There's something really good here. So, in my time remaining, I just want to look at one of those stories. It's a story we already started last week. It's in Luke, the 16th chapter. Because by the time we do this, I'm hoping we can come full circle and we'll be at our answer. Are you with me? Luke chapter 16, here's the story that Jesus tells us, the story of a man who hires his financial advisor, the guy who is the manager and taking care of all of his funds, and once he fires him, this guy thinks to himself, you know what, I can't, I, I can't do manual labor, I can't go back to that, I'm too old to get another job, and, and, and I'm, I'm too proud to beg. He says, what in the world am I going to do? Well, he has to get the books in order before he can leave his job. So he goes and he finds one of the people who owes his master some olive oil. Then he goes to find somebody else who owes him wheat. And what he does with the guy who has the olive oil, cuts the bill in half. And he writes it paid in full, right? You remember this story? We reviewed it a little bit last week. Well, when he's doing this, by the way, that part of the story often bothers people. And if you do a little research here, one of the things you're going to find is most commentators think, understanding the practices of the day, that this guy wasn't cheating his master. What he was probably doing These guys in this kind of position usually operated off of commission. So what he was probably doing is saying to himself, you know what? When I sell this stuff and I straighten out the books, I get a paycheck. But what good does it do me to take some money home today? It's only going to last me a week, right? So here's what he decides to do. I'm going to forego all that. I'm going to make investments in relationships. So, what he does with the first guy, cuts the bill in half. What he does with the second guy, reduces it 20 percent. He writes it paid in full. And in both cases, he makes friends with people, relationships that's going to go well beyond losing his job. And the master looks at that guy and says, that guy's wise. Then he makes the comment that we focused on last week. This is Luke chapter 16, verse 11. Get this. Because Jesus isn't just telling a story. Verse 11, he says, if you have not been faithful in handling money, who's going to entrust you with true riches? Are are, are the dots coming together here? There's a real blessing here, but you know what? You're going to miss it. We're all going to miss it. We don't know how to handle the money. So so back up, back up in the story, back up in the story to verse 9. Because here's what he says. He says, talking to us, those of us who follow him, he says, make sure you use your worldly wealth to, wealth to do what? Your money to do what? To develop friendships. Listen to this. This is Luke chapter 16, verse 9. Earn friendships, then you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. The life that never ends. Put put this together. He's not just talking about, you know, go out and have a good time with the money that you've got. No, he's talking about building relationships that last forever. You use your money like that. Here's the way he concludes the story. You're the person God's really going to entrust with treasure. How does that work? Here, 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 here. Follow me, follow me. Some of us, you know, more, more introvert than other people. I know a lot of people are shocked by that. But some of us, more introvert, and we think, you know, oh, wow, if I could just get away. 
right? You know, cabin in the mountains, you know, shack out there on uh, some deserted island, you know, and just away from people. Well, yeah, for a period of time. I get that. Some people may more, maybe a little bit more so than other people. But I tell you what, that's overbuilt up in our mind. How, how do I know that? Because of the way God made us. We need people in our lives. We have to have relationships. I love the way C.S. Lewis put this. C.S. Lewis said, you know what? The things that you enjoy most in life. Okay, can you think about that real quick? Some of the best experiences you've ever had, the, the best things you've ever gone through. Part of your enjoyment of that very experience is your ability to share it with somebody else. Are, are you following me here? It's the way God made us. It's, it's through relationships. And I'm guessing... I'm pretty confident that most of us have at least tasted a little bit of that. We've had, we've had at least a few relationships in our life where, you know what, that person made me a better person. That person really came through for me in a time of need. Wow, I'm, glad, I'm so glad God brought that person. You, you, you know what I mean? We've tasted of those things. But even though we've tasted those things, we've also had to deal with the other side, right? We've had times where people that we were really counting on, we thought, man, they're going to come through, and they never showed, Right? Or that time when they could have said something so positive when we, when we needed the, the gentle hand. Man, they came down like a ton of bricks and they crushed us. And it's like, you, you know what? Sometimes we're ready to walk away from people because we've, we've tasted the bad side too. Here's what I'm trying to say. In eternity, all the bad is gone. It's only perfect relationships forever. In fact, that's part of the experience is being able to share it with other people. It's not just streets paved with gold. It's not just all the wonders in life. It's the wonders beyond wonders with other people. And you and I get to contribute to them being there. Amen. <laughs> that is why, maybe you've already seen this, but that is why the, the closer you draw to people of faith who really understand this, you're going to see experiences that that maybe most people don't get to see because they don't go public with it. But you're going to find out that that couple literally did without so that they could support the missionary. They, they literally, not, not, I'm not just talking about sh cut short the vacation. Man, they, they had to, you know, even the basic food they were eating, they, they willingly gave it up because they saw something they could do with their money. And those very people will look at each other with a sincere smile on their face and say, we're rich. And they are, because they get it.
love this uh, meal packing event. It's so easy. It kind of blew my mind how like, this is it. This is all I have to do. I can just show up and put my hands to work for a little bit, don't even hurt my back, and hungry kids are fed, and I get to be encouraged with a bunch of other people. That's great. Count me in. Here's why I'm excited about this food packing event. A lot of people have really good intentions, but this is an opportunity to get your hands dirty and do something amazing for the kids in our community. We're the Elliots, and we're packing lunches, lunches for, for the children, children and, and we're very, very excited. excited. We're packing lunches! Woo! <laughs> teaching you, Brandon. Help others that are less fortunate and put other people's needs before your own. <laughs> Everything, all of it. Helping out. Helping people. Feeding kids. <laughs> Who doesn't want some sunflower feet? Yes, I am expert at taking care of kids and eating things, so <laughs> I feel very qualified. <laughs> Because I, I like get helping homeless people. We get to help the less fortunate, and um, and it's sad when you think about it that like they don't get access to the amount of food. Whereas, whereas I'm like snacking almost all day, pretty much. Um, we're giving back to those in need. We are helping out kids who would go hungry if not given this beautiful opportunity to have these wonderful bags of food. A marvelous program, and we're helping so many less fortunate people that I can't stand the thought of them going hungry. I'm Tony Derbyshire and this is my wife Claire. We've been involved with the Children's Hunger Project for the last year or so and we're packing food bags to benefit the students at Mila Elementary School who are students in need here in our local community. We've loved being part of this and partnering with the Children's Hunger Project. It's an amazing organization that does so much for students in Brevard County. We are so grateful to be taking a part in this mission. It has been just an awesome blessing for us personally to be involved with. I am more of the behind the scenes person. Um, it's not just the packing that we do at the events, but there's a lot that goes into it from picking up the food, having um, people set up the tables, having people unpack the boxes and get the line set up. It's just awesome. We've had so many wonderful people jump in and help in so many ways, and we're just thankful to be supporting this great organization. It's wrong. 